Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. How is everybody? All right. Well, I'm Joel. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here. Honored to serve under our pastors, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. And uh, happy Mother's Day to everybody. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, don't worry about that, uh, all you mothers. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to continue our series today. Uh, with It's called The Summer of Joy. We're going to be going through this entire summer, going through the book of Philippians, which is a fascinating book because it's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the people in Philippi, but he wrote it from prison. You can be confident if you ever get a letter from me in prison, it will not be a letter of joy. It will be a letter of uh, excuses and <laughs> I didn't do it. Let me out, right? But Paul is writing from prison and he's saying, guys, no matter what's happening around you, even if you're in a prison cell, joy can be found because joy has nothing to do with your outer circumstances. It has everything to do with what's going on inside of you and you can have confidence and joy. We're going to talk about today how to get access to that joy. Uh, but that's where we're going to go this morning. All right. So, Uh, My dad and I have this podcast together that we do. It's called The Malm Podcast, super original name. Um, But it's a podcast where I talk to my dad about stuff I learned from him growing up. My dad, quite honestly, is the man who's most like Jesus that I've ever met. He's not perfect, but he's pretty darn close, right? And uh, he is the wisest man I know. So I'll talk to him about stuff we, we, uh, just stuff he did growing up. Why do you do that, that, that stuff? And sometimes he gives me advice on how to raise my own daughter. And uh, the other day I had something come to mind that I brought up in the podcast. And it was the time that my dad helped me make a fake driver's license. Yeah. So I'll explain. Let me explain. Uh, We lived in Guatemala, Central America growing up. So we lived in Latin America. And uh, when, we, when I was 15, we came back to the U.S. one summer, and I took a driving course and got my learner's permit. So in Texas, if you're new to the state, at 15, you can get this learner's permit. And as long as you have somebody over 21 who has a license in the front seat, you can drive a car. Well, I was 15. We went back to Guatemala. And uh, my dad, at the time, I had a radio show on Thursday nights. I, did, I was a DJ on a local station down there. 102.9, Metro Stereo, una radio para ver. And I would do this show every Thursday night. And, uh, and, but the sto- show started at 8 and it would end at 11. And I think my dad just got so tired of picking me up that one day he's like, why don't you drive down there? I'm like, dad, I'm 15. Guatemala is a city of 7 million people. And I don't have a license. He's like, hey, give me, show me that learner's permit you got. And I got it. He's like, look, let's stick a picture on it. We had an extra passport picture sitting around. We stuck a picture on it, got a stamp and some official stamp we put on it. He had a round stamp that said something or other. It's all in English, so the cops couldn't read it. They only spoke Spanish. We laminated it, and he's like, you're good to go. And he let me drive late at night through the 7 million people, Guatemala City. Guatemala was still was not a super peaceful place at the time. It was actually in a civil war. I'll never forget one night we, were, we lived up in the mountain looking down over the city, a big city of 7 million. One night we saw this big flash and all of a sudden lights of the city started going and the whole place went dark, the whole valley because the guerrillas, the insurgent guerrillas had, not guerrillas, the guerrillas, had blown up a power plant and just shut down the whole city. So this, this is where I'm driving around. So the other day on the podcast, I said, Dad, what in the world were you thinking? Giving me, well, first of all, making an illegal license for me. (laughs) And he said, well, uh, you were ready for it. I was like, I was ready for it. He's like, yeah, you had proved that you were conscious of, you know, and I spoke Spanish really well. He's like, I just felt confident that you could do it. And also I was tired of driving you down there. (laughs) It's like, truth. Sometimes our motives are mixed, right? And I started asking him, I was like, okay, that's interesting because you also never gave me a curfew. And he goes, you never needed a curfew. You were always responsible to come home at a reasonable hour. And I remember sometimes I come up two in the morning from radio events. One night, they let me stay up the whole night. I did an actual, like a marathon all through the night doing the radio, the radio show and they let me do it. And I thought, well, that's fascinating. I'm like, but, but you gave Karis a curfew, my sister. And he goes, yeah, because she needed it. She, she needed a hard stop. The party stops at this time. Come home, right? So it got me thinking about the nature of love because what's fascinating about love is, you know, you can love 
people love two people, but they require love, a different kind of love. If you've ever had kids and they're different, each one of them requires a different kind of love. And you can try and show love to one person in one way and it works with them. But if you show love to that person, the other person in another way, it doesn't work for them. And it gets really complicated. And, and in marriage, you have this. We're like, oh, you're trying to show love to your spouse and it just doesn't seem to be resonating. You go, what, what's the deal? She's not receiving it. And here's what I know about everybody in this room. Every one of us, we've got somebody in our life that you're trying to show them you love them. Maybe that's why you're working all those hours trying to make that money to show them why you show them you love them. Or maybe that's why you go overboard, you know, preparing things for them or doing acts of service for them. Or that's maybe why you're always trying to encourage them with your words, but it's not working. And you're going, I'm trying to show them I'm loving them, but it's like we're strangers passing in the night and I just cannot communicate. I love her or him or them or the kids or it's just not working because love is really tricky because it requires a different set of skills in every situation. And sometimes love means you go along with somebody and you just pick them up time after time and time after time after they fall. And sometimes love means letting somebody fall flat on their face and not pick them up, let them pick themselves up so that they can get, learn the results of their decisions and go, wow, that really hurt. I'm not gonna do that again. But when you buffer them from the fall every time, they never learn the lesson. That's right. So we're gonna talk about that this morning. How to know the proper way to love someone in a way that's going to get through to them. So Paul's writing this letter to the Philippians. We talked last week. He starts off the letter and he says, Paul and Timothy to all the saints at Philippi. And if, if you haven't, if you weren't here last week, I would really encourage you to go back and listen to the message last week because I went into full teacher mode. I even had a map and everything and we used Greek words and it was really awesome. But uh, we, we talked about Philippi and what the significance of Philippi was. And Paul really loved the Philippians. Like they were his bros and sisters. Like he really loved them. So he's writing to them and he says, I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayer for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he'll carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We talked about this big theological word last week, sanctification, which is what Paul's talking about there. He calls them saints. He says, all the saints at Philippi. And we talked last week about the fact that you're a saint the moment you accept the gift of Christ on the cross. A lot of us grew up in traditions where we say a saint is someone who does really good works and then we honor them afterwards for their saintliness. But Paul says, right now, right where you are, if you've accepted Jesus' gift on the cross, you're a saint. And you do good works now not to become a saint. You do work, good works because you are a saint. And that was a hard thing for me to, to process as a kid. I was telling you last week about how I learned this when I was 16, this verse. I had to memorize the book of Philippians to get out of, uh, get out of high school. And I remember reading this thing, saints, and the lady said, you're a saint. I said, I'm not a saint because I'm, I'm a 16-year-old boy and I'm thinking about girls all the time. And I'm thinking not very good thoughts about girls. And I'm thinking, I'll be a saint once I clean up my thought life. And she's like, no, you already are a saint. Now clean up your thought life. He's given you the power to do it. And it's a whole different angle. It's like, wow, I've got the power to do this because of who I already am in Christ. I think this is the foundation of everything we believe. And that's what Paul's saying. The sanctification process, the moment you accept the gift Jesus gave you on the cross by dying for your sins and doing what you could not do on your own, you're justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned when God looks at me. And now God says, and now I love you so much, I'm not gonna let you stay the same. And this is sanctification. It's the process of being freed from sin or purified. And he's saying, guys, I know it's a struggle for you every day to beat those bad thoughts, to beat those horrible things, to beat that tendency you have to lie and cover and to beat that pride. But I'm telling you, he who began a good work, he'll stop at nothing to complete that work in you. And that's sanctification. So then he goes on and says this. It's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you're all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. He's like, you guys are with me. You get the mission and you're on mission with me. He says, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ Jesus, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
I want to focus on this line right here because I think it's pretty powerful. He says, my prayer is that your love may abound more and more, that it abounds with knowledge and all discernment. Now, the older I get, the more I'm convinced that the true sign of maturity is how loving you've become. In fact, I think you can kind of test if you learned anything from any season of life that was really hard by asking yourself this. On the other side of it, did I become more loving through that? Or did I double down and become more hard-headed? If you became more loving, I believe you're becoming more mature. In fact, in 2 Peter, I'm writing a book about this right now, so I've been thinking about it a lot. Peter says this, he says, now add to your faith virtue, add to your virtue knowledge, add to your knowledge self-control, add to self-control endurance, add to endurance godliness, and then add Philadelphia, which is brotherly love. And then he says, and the pinnacle of it all is add agape, add perfect love. So it starts with faith and it ends with love with the, all these processes in between. That's the highest thing. And agape is the exact same word that Paul uses here. It's my prayer that your agape may abound more and more. And this word agape is fascinating because C.S. Lewis, he wrote a book called The Four Loves. And he talked about the fact that the Greek, they, the, in Greek, there were four different kinds of love they referred to. One was storge, which is an empathy. And an empathy is just kind of love where you're like, oh, that guy's in a bad situation. I really feel for them. Doesn't really go beyond that. We're really good at this, at this in our world today. We're really good at empathy, uh, which is fascinating because there wasn't a whole lot of empathy in the world until Jesus came along. And then he changed the entire trajectory of the world's moral compass. And now we realize that love and compassion is a thing. And now sometimes the world judges us and you're like, you're not as caring and compassionate as us, you church people. But what they're just basing it off of is empathy. And the dangerous thing about empathy is it can become very self-centered very quickly. Because when you're empathic, you start to think, I really care about that situation. I'm a good person. In fact, I'm going to take a little thing and I'm going to stick it over my Facebook picture that says, I support such and such lives. They matter. Or I got the COVID vax and you didn't. I'm a good person. I'm, you know, I'm joking, but I'm serious. We, we like to show people we care about the situation. We're empathetic. But it can really turn, quickly turn into virtue signaling where you're going, I'm just going to act like I care about this just so people think I'm a good person because I'm supposed to care about this. And it can become really self-centered. And it's all about you. Yep. Then there's another kind of love, philia. This is friendship. Uh, the word, the town Philadelphia is Philadelphia in, in Pennsylvania is called the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Uh, as of late, it's come to mean something different in that town. But... Uh, <laughs> It actually comes to mean this kind of love. The second one, eros, which is a romantic love. The word erotic comes from eros. This can also become very self-centered. How many times do we love somebody because of how they make us feel about ourselves? All of these are very, they're, they're, they're kind of a glimpse of love, but they're not the purest love. The highest form of love is agape love. It's a perfect love. And I'm absolutely convinced, and I think the Bible backs this up, that you don't get this kind of love apart from God's love being poured into your heart. It says through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You only get access to agape love. You can only love perfectly with God's love because apart from that, I mean, honestly, we've got mixed motives. Don't you know that? Most of us, we've got pretty mixed motives on how we love people. And even if we think our love is pure, it can be tainted. Yeah. Right after my daughter was born, I was, I had been freaking out. You know, I think all men do this. When they find out a kid is coming into the world, you start freaking out and you're like, <gasps> how much is this going to cost? What's this going to require of me? So I started working really hard. I started a business and the business started booming. And um, man, we were just a few months into my daughter being born. We're walking her around, pushing her around a uh, a park, and I turned to Emily and I said, Emily, isn't it amazing that God has provided and this business is doing so well? I don't have to report to anybody. Everything's doing good. Everything's so great. Right? Nope. And she just kind of quietly pushes along. I'm like, Right? She's like, I, I guess for you it's good. I, I, she said, I, I kind of feel like I'm drowning over here. I was like, What, what do you mean drowning? And she said, Well, you're, you're always working. And this was tricky because I work from home. So I was like, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to provide. And I started getting a little upset with her. I said, I did all this for you and her. And she's like, yeah, maybe. 
but you were also freaking out about money. So maybe, and I started, I started evaluating my motives and I realized, yeah, I loved them, but I was also kind of freaking out that I wouldn't have money. And this is a challenge for us guys because we love our family and oftentimes we want to provide through giving money, which maybe doesn't translate to them as love. But if you're honest about your motives, you also want to be able to pay for that fishing boat. I'm making all this money for you guys so you can live the life that I want to live. (laughs) This is a tricky part about it. And our motives get in there and they get super complicated and we go, oh, that's where King David, he says, search me and know me, O God. See if there's any unclean, unpure way in me. And here's the beautiful thing about God. He's so big and he can read your motives. He can work in spite of your motives. He can get his job done, but we need to be really cautious because oftentimes what we're thinking, when we're thinking we're loving somebody, it's not actually for the sake of them. It's for the sake of what it's doing for us. And that's not the perfect love that comes from the Father. Perfect love, Paul says, requires two things. He says, I want you to grow in knowledge and discernment. And I'm convinced what this means is knowledge is your knowledge of the unique situation. You need to really be aware of what's going on in the life of the person that you're trying to show love to, and you need to know them well. You have to be paying attention, which is really hard in today's world because most of us don't have much of an attention span, do we? We've got the attention span of a squirrel. Because social media is grabbing our attention. Everybody wants our attention. Sometimes people under our own roof are struggling and we don't see it because we just don't have the attention to give to them. And when you don't pay attention, you don't get the knowledge of knowing what they may need in that situation. And then you don't have the discernment to know about the right response. And and, and this is the challenge. And, And this is why I'm convinced families are so important. Because in a family, it's the smallest unit of cohesion in a society. And if we can't pay attention to what's going on in our own families, we won't know what's going on. And that's why I'm convinced the government can never solve our social problems. Because the only thing the government can do is create cookie cutter responses because they're trying to deal with large groups of the population. And so they'll say, everybody needs to do this. Everybody needs to take this. Everybody needs to respond this way. And listen, there are some things that everybody needs to do. They're called laws. And there's 10 of them God laid out that never change. The Ten Commandments, those never change and there's no room for compromise on those. But how many of you know that there's some things (laughs) that you get to in life and you're like, this isn't in the Ten Commandments. How am I supposed to show love in this situation? And that's when we get into these odd situations where we go, this isn't in the Bible, but what's, what's the proper response? And this is where we have to be driven by, first of all, knowledge of the unique situation and discernment about the right response. M. Scott Peck, he says this, he says, love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. The question we need to always be asking is, is the way I'm trying to show them love going to help them grow? Because that's what God does for us. You know, right before God, Jesus left the earth, he basically said to all, to all of the disciples, he said, guys, I got to go. <laughs> but You're going to be glad that I'm leaving because I'm going to send you something great. He says, there's a whole lot more I want to show you, but basically you can't handle the truth. (laughs) You can't handle it. If I told you the whole truth right now, it would crush you. I mean, there's so many times where I'm just like, God, just show me what I need to know. And I'm thank God he doesn't because it would crush me if I knew all of how short I fall from the glory of God. (laughs) I'd be like, put me in a hole right now and bury me. So what the Holy Spirit does, it says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and says, he says, Jesus says, he's going to guide you in all truth. And the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is he guides you in the truth you need, in the way you need it, at the time you need it, in a way that you'll understand it. He's really that good. And he reveals the way that God loves us. He says, man, you can't handle the whole truth right now, but I'm going to show you the truth that you need right now to live up to, to push yourself to the next level. And I think that's an example of how we're called to love others. It's always about helping them grow. And that's where it gets tricky. Because sometimes that means you stay long with somebody and you pick them up time and time again. And other times it means you let them suffer the results of their decisions. And it hurts you to see it. I know it hurts God to see us beating our head against the wall over and over again. But he's like, I need them to learn because I've got big plans for them. And one of these days they're going to go, ouch, this hurts enough that I'm going to (laughs) stop. 
And that's where love gets tricky, but it's always about the growth of the other person. And this is where love gets so complicated. So Paul says this, he says, look, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but don't have love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Sometimes we can think we're being so loving because we eloquently present our case to someone and then they don't receive it. To them, it just sounds like a, clonk, a gong or a cymbal because maybe we've got the wrong motives in how we're doing it. If I understand all the mysteries and knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. You can be like this powerful, strong person, but if you don't have love, it's nothing. He says, if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. How many of us go, I can't believe she did this to me. I was always there for her. I always took care of her. And then when she, whenever I struggle, she's not there for me. I gave my body to be burned for them and they're not there for me. And we have to start going, what are our motives? And oftentimes we don't even know our motives. And this is where the gift of the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. He brings truth. And when we seek him, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. The Holy Spirit, I'm convinced of this. There is no formula for life. There's only revelation from the Holy Spirit. And we have to depend on him over and over and over and over for discernment. Because there are going to be some times where you're dealing with somebody and you're going, I'm trying to show them love, them love, but it's not working. And then you'll say, Lord, show me what I need to do. And the Holy Spirit will tell you what you need to do. And, and here's what will happen. You'll show them love in the way that the Holy Spirit said it. And also, listen, here's a tip. If you feel like God's telling you to do something, always check it with a spiritual advisor because it's going to be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Sometimes God will ask you to do something that seems counterintuitive or it'll seem uncomfortable for you. And you go, but if I do that, that'll make me look like a bad parent. Everybody's going to judge me for not bailing her out. But maybe that's what needs to happen. You check it with advisors. And then, then what, here's what happens. If you're trusting the Holy Spirit is going to guide you, even if they don't respond to your love, you can be confident that ultimately it was loving. And it may take 10, 15, 20 years, or it may take getting on the other side of the space-time continuum and they go, Thank you for showing me love even though I didn't respond to it. Because oftentimes people won't respond to love. And that's why we have to depend on discernment from the Holy Spirit about what is the thing that's going to help them grow. And that's where Paul says, guys, I want you to get this. In you growing into more of love, which is walking more in the love that God wants to pour through you, I want you to have knowledge and discernment. I want you to pay really close attention to those around you and what they need. And then I want you to seek me for discernment on how to show them the love that I have for them through you. And that's the only way we're going to really make it in this world is seeking the Holy Spirit for guidance on how to love those around us and asking over and over again, what does love require of me in this situation? What does love take from me? Do you guys receive that? All right, let me pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you have sent the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. I thank you, Lord, that uh, whatever we need, you have the answer for us. You see all things, know all things, and you give perfect love. So I pray for those this morning that are, man, maybe they're dealing with somebody in their life. They're going, man, I just wish I could show them I love them. I pray you would give them, the, as they seek you, I pray you would give them wisdom and guidance. It says, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask of God who will give to them wisdom and he don't, he'll do it without reproach. So I thank you, Lord. You're gonna give us wisdom and how to navigate our relationships and that we can grow more and more. Our love will grow in discernment and in knowledge. If you're here this morning, you've not give, given your life to Jesus. This is the foundation, this first step you take to get on track and walk with Him. I'm going to say a prayer in a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it, God's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness. He's going to set you up in eternity with Him in the kingdom of light. Forgive all your sins and get you on the path to that sanctification process. It starts when we say this prayer. Let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you back there under the do it again sign. Um, I pray you guys have a great morning. Mothers, don't forget to head out to the gathering place for some pictures and a small token of our appreciation. I read it verbatim there for y'all. You guys are dismissed. Have a great Mother's Day. Be blessed. We'll see y'all next week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. 
Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.